So I title my dissertation, The Bite Model of Authoritarian Control, Undue Influence, Thought Reform, Brainwashing, Mind Control, Trafficking, and the Law. And I know I did too many words than what dissertations usually have, but I wanted keywords uh, in search for uh, what I'm about to present. And I wanna thank my dissertation another, committee. And please everybody mute um, if, 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 if it's not me. Uh, Judy, uh, Dr. Keith Melville, Rich Applebaum, Michael Commons, and, and Fielding graduate alumni of the media department, Christine Marie Cadis is our, is my, was my student reader. And I guess I wanna start out by saying that the problem is that while the law has remedies for when people take away the rights of others, it's mostly involved with bodily harm or money, but not psychological abuse and trauma and such. But as I'll get into my presentation in my, my deep literature review, I discovered there were efforts to address this problem from different angles. And my hope in doing this work is to create a tool that the legal community can use to understand what's the difference between ethical and unethical uh, uh, influence. Uh, I also want to say uh, it was February of 1974 when I was recruited into a cult of, called the Moonies uh, and spent two and a half years uh, in the cult, dropped out of college, etc. That month, Patty Hearst was kidnapped by force out of her apartment by the Symbionese Liberation Army, was on the lam, was arrested, tried, and sent to jail for robbing a, a bank and a sporting goods store. And as a form, I was out by that point through a deprogramming, thanks to my family's love and efforts. It always struck me as I was so lucky not to have committed any crimes. Um, I also wanted to say tomorrow, November 18th, is the anniversary of the Jonestown massacre with over 913 people, including over 300 children, Congressman Ryan assassinated and Ron Harris from NBC. So for me, this has been a 44 year full-time quest to try to um, be an activist and help solve the problems involved with mind control, et cetera. So this was a picture of Moon being coronated in the Senate Dirksen Senate office building a number of years ago, one of his mass weddings, enough of moon. And I always like to use this slide in my presentations to try to make it personal to whoever's listening. And that is how would you know if you were under mind control or if you had been unduly influenced? And the truth is, is it's not so easy because when I was in the cult, and my sister and brother-in-law who helped rescue me are on this call. They try to tell me I was brainwashed. They try to tell me I was in a cult, but I was in a blinders situation where I was in a new reality, a new identity. Um, and in fact, the uh, American Psychiatric Association Diagnostic Statistical Manual version five, but the four had it and three names a dissociative disorder that talks about identity disturbance and explicitly says individuals who have been subjected to intense coercive persuasion, e.g. brainwashing, thought reform, indoctrination while captive, torture, long-term political imprisonment, recruitment by sects or cults or by terror organizations. So um, a lot of cults have put out this information that there's no such thing, but in fact, clinicians have been encountering this for decades. Um, and the simplest way to explain it is when I, uh, who I was before the Moonies, I was a Jew from Queens, by the way, I grew up 1.3 miles from Donald Trump uh, the poor side of Union Turnpike. Um, 
but I was a Jew who wrote poetry and played basketball and liked women. And within a few weeks, I became a right wing fascist who thought that democracy was satanic. Within a year, I was believing the Holocaust was necessary. Uh, I was fasting for Nixon to be president because God wanted him to be president. So for me, uh, th this journey has been extremely intense over these years, ex especially the last four years. So I just wanted to say that when you think of cults, a lot of people think of people in robes living in isolated places, and that's not useful. In fact, people are in all types of different one over one cults, political cults, therapy cults, religious cults, commercial cults known as trafficking, as well as multi-level marketing groups and large group uh, awareness trainings. When my, when my uh, deprogramming was taking place back in 1976, one of the things that helped me a lot was understanding Chinese communist brainwashing studies. I'm not going to take the time uh, today to, to explain all of these models, but they're all contained within my dissertation in detail because I wanted to pull together all of the most prominent the, uh, theories and models that incorporate undue influence in its varieties of forms. Um, and Lifton has been a mentor, someone I've interviewed multiple times. And in courts of law, Lifton's model, and soon I will get to Margaret Singer's models, have been used uh, in testifying about undue influence. Um, but those uh, were qualitative studies. They were based on interviews with people who had been, uh, who had experienced uh, thought reform or brainwashing and such. And as you will find out towards uh, into this presentation, we, we now have a quantitative uh, study uh, that offers a more concrete uh, model. So in addition to Lifton and Singer, I wanted to add Edgar Schein uh, and his book, Coercive Persuasion, that I read when I first got out. And he presented Kurt Lewin, one of the most famous social psychologists model of unfreezing, changing, refreezing. Unfreezing means disorienting a person's sense of self. Changing means the indoctrination into a new ideology and a new identity. And then the refreezing of that identity. And I, when I started my program at Fielding, um, I was surprised Edgar Schein was like a legend in the field of organizational change and development. And I went, I know his work, this is amazing. Um, and in fact, when I did my, my uh, lit review, I realized, oops, um, I lost my thing, um, that in 2014, he actually presented a model uh, for, uh, that he calls coercive persuasion uh, that I wanted to uh, also include in this presentation. You'll see the themes uh, being called out. Um, for me, as I was learning all of these models, I learned about cognitive dissonance theory that was based on the work of social psychologist Leon Festinger, studying a UFO cult where the leader had prophesied that a, a spaceship would land on a mountain at a particular day and time. And he and his students posited that people would lose faith after the spaceship didn't show up. And in fact, people believed more. And that led to the uh, development of the cognitive dissonance model, which says human beings like to be congruent. They like to have things line up between their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And if you change one, the other two will shift to reduce dissonance. And I love that model. So, and, and then I was trying to think of a, a more um, simple way to describe my experience in the moon cult and the many, many people that I went on to help uh, becoming a, a licensed mental health counselor out of cults. And I decided that I could use thought, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but I, I wanted, there was something else missing and it was information control. 
And so it, I came about this model called the bite model for those four things. And I decided not to include the slides because there are a lot of details in it, but you can go to my website uh, for the detailed uh, explanation of, of the bite model. And the next slide is my influence continuum that I put together that describes ethical influence, which includes informed consent to destructive unhealthy influence, which is lying, whether it's uh, distorting information, withholding vital information or outright lying. And there are real themes to distinguish ethical versus unethical, what's factual, what's disinformation, as well as what's healthy for leadership and what's unhealthy in types of, of organizations. So this and the bite model become a way that anybody can look at their experience, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one or a multi-level marketing group or a corporation that they work for, uh, and say, you know what, this is more uh, on the dark side of fear and guilt and control and obedience. Um, one more model I thought I, sh I should include is the idea that most people involved with destructive cults are really, from my point of view, fringe members. They're, they don't know what's really going on inside, certainly not at the apex of the pyramid. And so for them that may not feel so totalistic or controlling, um, but my lens is, is, is from, from out here looking in and overall there's a, a, a recipe or a, a, a mechanism to um, uh, evaluate uh, healthy or unhealthy things. So let's see if I can get this to move down. There we go. So I wanted to then, in, in, the, in the lit review, I realized trafficking was passed as a law against enslaving people. And the definition, and I should say the Keith Ranieri Nexium cult, he's in jail for 120 years, and he was put in jail because of trafficking laws and not because of undue influence laws, et cetera. And the government defines fraud, uh, force fraud and coercion uh, uh, in terms of trafficking. But this again, overlaps with the themes of the brainwashing and thought reform literature, the coercive persuasion literature, and of course the bite model. And there are quite a few laws that I've included in my dissertation as well. Very interestingly, there has been development in elderly, elder law, and there are five models there for evaluating undue influence, but it's all pretty much aimed at getting control of someone's assets or property or money. And I'll just mention that susceptibility, opportunity, disposition, and result, the Soder model, uh, figures uh, strongly. Uh, if for the interest of time and wanting to have uh, lots of questions and answers, I won't go into all of these models, but needless to say, they're all describing the same kind of phenomenon um, of abuse and exploitation by a predator on someone who's vulnerable. And as you see, Margaret Singer's model, the one that I mentioned earlier with the six conditions is cited here as well. And I was shocked to learn that California passed a law on undue influence in 2014. Um, and they, they actually then created a, uh, a, a skilled um, toolkit for uh, elder care workers to evaluate undue influence with, with elderly people. And again, it looks at the vulnerability of the victim, the influencers' uh, authority over them, the specific actions or tactics, as well as uh, uh, the, the um, taking advantage of, uh, of the person. In 2015, one of my mentors, a former law professor emeritus, Alan Shefflin, uh, uh, wrote a paper on his social influence model. And he explicitly wrote this for experts 
uh, expert witnesses to be able to have a framework for anyone to evaluate undue influence. Um, it ranges from the influencer to the influencee and purpose and techniques and timing and setting. And of course, the methods and techniques is where my bite model falls firmly into that. Um, so I'm not only trying to pull together the existing laws, the existing models on brainwashing and mind control and connect it with um, uh, the mental health system, but for my study, uh, it's been quite an interesting journey and I'm now bitten by the research bug. Uh, so I intend to do a lot more research, which I'll cover at the end of this presentation. But essentially I took um, all of the elements of the bite model, things like control of food, control of sleep, control of clothing, et cetera. And I turned it into a, a, a scaled thing where people could say it never happened to them, always happened to them or in between. And so um, we asked lots of demographic questions and we had a bunch of items. And, in, and what we were wanting to do is develop this uh, instrument uh, of the bite model. We, we, we took the, the original bite model, turned it into Likert scales. We had people reviewing it who were experts. We tested it on some people. We did some edits. And then we posted it on uh, SurveyMonkey. Um, and here's an example of what it looked like and people would be coding it never to always. Uh, things like I felt forced to be obedient to leaders and group rules or I felt pressured to obey even when I disagreed with the rules. Um, so these are some of the behavioral control um, questions that scored over 0.7, which I decided uh, that was, was highly significant. And so we disregarded uh, the ones that were lower. Information control, the highest thing was evasion, misdirection, changing the subject was used to avoid critical questions, lying, especially to outsiders, to advance the group aims, uh, not honestly answering critical questions, uh, distorting information. And thought control, um, asking critical questions was a sin, essentially, or people were in rebellion. And it was always the dogma or the group policy over them as an individual. And there was no other alternative belief systems that, that offered any, any validity whatsoever. And, and I'm not gonna read all of them. And I will post the recording of this for those of you who wanna go through it more slowly and the dissertation itself will get published. Um, and emotional controls, um, essentially phobia indoctrination scored the highest that if you didn't do what the group wanted you to do, terrible things would happen to you. That scored 0.835. Uh, also in the mindset of someone uh, in a mind control or authoritarian cult, there was no future. If you ever left, only terrible things would happen. There was no happiness, no fulfillment if you left. And people were taught to block any negative emotions like homesickness or wanting to sleep longer um, or, or not uh, liking to be abused and bullied. So what was so interesting and totally surprising was when we did a, a, a principal component analysis, a factor analysis on the results of the study, they all came down to one thing called control. And it makes sense if you think about it. A, uh, I started writing about the bite model over 30 years ago and I knew it fit my experience and it fit the experiences of the thousands of people that I've met. Um, and people to this day keep reading combating cult mind control and seeing how the bite model saved their lives. So it made sense that behavior control, information control, thought control and emotional control would come up as control. But 
One of the interesting things uh, in the last four years is I've been participating every Wednesday at the program in psychiatry at the law that's associated with Harvard Medical School and learning from some of the top forensic psychiatrists and psychologists and attorneys who are part of this think tank. And they, some of them were, Steve, undue influence is a known quantity. Don't mess around with it. It's going to be an uphill battle. Pick a new term and you can define it. It was their advice. And, and as we did the analysis, it turned out that, oh, let's call it authoritarian control. And I looked it up in the dictionary and blind submission to authority, suppression of individual thoughts and free will. And I went, Eureka, <laughs> that's what we're gonna call it. So from that moment on, instead of calling it the bite model of mind control, it's now the bite model of authoritarian control. And here's uh, some of the scree plots from those four um, uh, dimensions. And as you can see, there's just super high significance and then it drops off quickly and the rest, the variance is really noise because what stands out uh, so powerfully is um, control, essentially. Um, and the, the two things down here were really in, in the fives, 0.5, and we decided to just focus on the, the highest significance possible. And with the component matrix, uh, just some of the things that didn't score that high, they're still significant. And I think in future research, we're going to want to um, look at these and, and, and flesh them out some more. But for now, the critical thing is that we got such a high significance um, uh, for authoritarian control from the bite model um, that we really think that this is, uh, as Judy said at the beginning, operationalizing a very uh, difficult concept. And instead of the slippery slope uh, argument of one person's cult is another person's religion or who's to say uh, or blaming the victim, uh, the bite model and the influence continuum can be a term that lawyers can use, uh, expert witnesses can use potentially to explain to judges and juries. Um, I also wanted to comment that, that there's a term, and thanks to Rich Applebaum for this, uh, of Adorno study on authoritarian personalities and Altmaier continued that research looking at, in Shefflin's terms, the influencee and like what makes the person susceptible to control and influence. And I have a lot of ideas about that, including uh, lack of secure attachment, including corporal punishment, but those are other studies. Um, again, what, what uh, I'm so excited about is that the bite model um, is a behavioral uh, frame that anybody can look at and apply to anything from a controlling relationship to a government, an authoritarian government. Uh, and I wanted to include a few demographics in terms of my study, which was done anonymously online through SurveyMonkey. The majority of the respondents were women. Uh, most came from the United States, but other English speaking countries, not surprisingly, because the study was in English. Um, but I really think that there are other factors, other forces, I should say, of undue influence that need to be uh, looked at uh, further, including uh, the, the hypnotic techniques, which are rampant right now on YouTube and on social media. Um, issues of sleep deprivation, which America as a society, we're all sleep deprived, which make us, makes us more vulnerable to uh, uh, disinformation and recruitment into crazy groups like QAnon, uh, which is a destructive cult, phobia indoctrination and threats. Um, and 
you know, the implications can be potentially huge because instead of just helping elderly people uh, concerned about their property and their inheritance, uh, I believe this is a huge step, potentially a huge step forward to um, all kinds of amelioration of, of, of hurtful uh, acts, whether it's, uh, I wrote a blog about a divorce attorney in Ohio who um, was hypnotizing his female clients, raping them and giving them amnesia. And he was uncovered with the help of uh, one of his victims and the police, but there's no law for what he was doing. I mean, he raped them, so there was a law, but there was no recognition by the law currently that the use of covert hypnosis should be a crime. And I can add that the, the country of Israel actually passed the law that you have to be a clinical uh, healthcare professional to do hypnosis or to say you're doing hypnosis. At least they have a step in the right direction. We have nothing like that in the United States. Um, I have clients whose loved ones are adults, but they're clearly being manipulated, exploited, and controlled. But because they're over the age of majority, uh, they have no legal recourse to help their loved one. And this includes women and men who are being sex trafficked by pimps who are using drugs and hypnosis to keep people enslaved. But, but families have no legal recourse and I'm hoping potentially there can be a way that families can go to a judge and say, your honor, here's, here's the Shefflin uh, uh, social influence model. Here's the influence continuum and the bite model. And here's what is being done to our loved one. Can we please have, please have temporary custody for even a week? to get the person away from that environment and to, to educate them. Um, and other things that I'm really interested in studying is the harm that's been caused by people who have been subjected to authoritarian control, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative problems, panic and anxiety attacks. And I'm also very interested in hypnosis. It's something I've been studying since 1980 um, and the whole issue of suggestibility, compliance to authority. Um, and my friend who's a, who's a PhD from Harvard School of Public Health has been telling me for almost 20 years, Steve, you need to do an epidemiological study to figure out the scope, how many people are being impacted here and what's the public health ramifications, the, the, the implications um, in terms of productivity, uh, healthcare, uh, people who are being uh, institutionalized in psychiatric hospitals who have not been properly diagnosed. So I'd love to see that done. I'm also very interested in seeing if big data can offer us some really concrete uh, support for the, this social influence model to demonstrate um, uh, when someone is being a predator and, and unethically influencing someone. So I added hypnosis and NLP, what's known as neuro-linguistic programming. Um, and I, 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 I wanted to uh, end by saying the last few months I've been studying QAnon uh, in depth, I did a TEDx uh, 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 that was 90 minutes with fellow researchers, David Troy and Jim Stewartson. Um, and it really is a destructive authoritarian cult. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, and with that, I am gonna wrap up my, my presentation and thank you. And thank, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Christine. And thanks for all of uh, uh, all of you for helping me over these years. Yeah.